I'm looking around. Nope. All right. Then we'll open it up to public comment. And we have one public comment. Todd Madison. Hey, All right. Todd. Thanks. Um, do you want me to talk about C and D combined or do you want me to stop after C and do you need oh. three minutes for each? No, no. Okay. Not at all. Okay, then combine them if you'd like. Okay. And yeah, we'll it'll see. be less than less than three minutes for both. Okay, great. Um, Go ahead, Todd. So thank you. Um, so anyway, so on C, great to see all the new hires here. It looks like the district's providing some opportunities for people to work, which is great given the general unemployment level out there now. This is awesome. It was good to see the good news about our support staff a little earlier as well. Um, I remember last year we saw a personnel commission report noting the district gets an average of seven fully qualified applicants in every opening, which is a number private industry recruiter would kill for. So that's great. People like uh, coming to work for us. A note on these orders, since finding out last year the district didn't keep statistics on employee turnover, I've been doing that myself. Adding the 13 resignations here gives us a total of 46 voluntary resignations this year with 737 classified FTEs in the adopted budget. That means we have a voluntary turnover rate of 6.24% so far this year, which annualizes out to 8.56. According to ADP, one of the largest payroll processes in the world, the industry average for the education sector is 19.2, which is over twice OUSD's rate. So we have a, a, a very low turnover rate, which is awesome. Must mean people like working here. They feel adequately paid and like it, like it. And thanks to OUSD management for that. Um, so moving on to D, um, similar on there, you know, I think it's, it shows that people like working here. We have such a low number of resignations. Um, four resignations here gives us a total of 20 this year. 918 certificated FTEs means the rate is 2.18%, annualized 2.99%, which is six times lower than the industry standard for the education sector. Um, again, it's a great testament to how much people like working here. And I need to point out, having managed groups of people like this, that it certainly means they enjoy working for the people they work for and that they feel adequately paid. Otherwise, they would be looking for other jobs. Um, so it's great to see that. Thank you very much to OUSD management. Thank you, Todd. Yes. All right, let's, let's go ahead and do that. Um, we have a total of eight public comments tonight. Unless that's right, Ann. And let's go ahead and pull them yes. up. And do you want to call them up? Todd uh, Madison. Again, Heine Bauer. Allison Menu. Elaine Kiswick. And then I'll come back and call the others. All right. This is um, an important part of the evening, the public comments. So I just wanted, we're happy to receive comments about this item and other issues on the agenda. So thanks for signing up. We, each person will have three minutes to speak. Um, so I just wanted to remind people the rules. I know Todd, you know them. So <laughs> yeah. all right. We're going to set the timer and go ahead. You're up, Todd. All right. Thank you. So we appreciate the moving of elementary school to five days a week, but of course we prefer a full-time schedule as well as moving secondary to the same. Um, we've seen all the timelines presented by the district on things that have been done to deal with the COVID crisis, but missing is the one thing parents have been clear on from the beginning, a plan for full-time reopening of in-person instruction. Last spring, we saw the district send out the last objective survey of parents we've seen in this entire year. The last survey to actually ask parents whether they wanted full schools to reopen for full-time in-person instruction. The results of that survey were announced in the June 9th board meeting. 53% of parents wanted to return to full-time. 53% is not only a plurality, but a majority. The district and board, of course, ignored this. On July 14th, the petition signed by over 500 parents urging the district to make a plan for full-time return was presented to our board. Ultimately, almost 700 signatures were gathered in support. The district and board ignored this. On July 18th, the group of parents rallied at MLK Park to demand that the district put together a plan for full-time return to school. The district and board ignored this. In August and September, we saw the waiver process introduced. Many parents spoke at board meetings asking the district to apply for these waivers. The district and board ignored this. In September, we saw districts with similar composition to Oceanside Elementaries, like Del Mar Union, reopen and prove that it could be done safely. The district and board ignored this. Last fall in my board campaign, I stood on almost 5,000 driveways and doorsteps speaking to thousands of people. During various board meetings during that time, I related the hardships of parents and kids were going through. Unlike our board, I had stood in front of them and listened to their thoughts. 
the district and board ignored this as well. Enrollment has dropped, which will impact future revenue. The district is not providing the education kids parents want for their kids, so they're taking them elsewhere. The district and board have ignored this. We see an unprecedented dollars flow into our schools, as we've just seen, at over almost $60 million, plus another $20 million for kids that are not actually being educated. We've seen many million spent, but still no full-time return. And lastly, over this time, we've seen hundreds of parents speak at these meetings, urging the board to listen to them and do what is right for the kids. The district and board, of course, have ignored these parents, instead putting together a partial plan meant to placate its special interests rather than do what parents want, which is what we've seen again tonight. It's nice that elementary school is now on the path, um, just in time for the end of the school year, but what about secondary kids? We'd like to see you make right by your promise to, ju to judge and move quickly to fully reopen all of our schools to the greatest extent, extent possible. Is tonight the night our district and board are going to stop ignoring parents and finally take action to do what parents want? I hope so. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Who's our next speaker, Ann? Amy Ballard. Hi, Jamie. You're up. Good evening, board members. My name is Jamie, and while I only have one child, at South O Elementary. My concern tonight is for kids in all ages at all schools in OUSD. I will admit until last spring when the schools were shut down, I did not pay attention to what goes on in school board meetings. I had naively assumed that districts operated within the boundaries of the law and always put what parents and students' concerns were first and always were looking out for the best interest of the students. And to say that my eyes have been opened is an absolute understatement. It brings to mind a comment or a quote by Maya Angelou, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. And what I have witnessed in the decisions of this board over the last 13 months has really shown me that I was mistaken that the district had the interest of the students at the highest priority. In the beginning, we all freaked out with the data and it seemed like closing schools was a good idea. But over time, the data has shown that not only is it safe to be in school in person, but it actually is, does more harm than good. The state and county safety protocol requirements should have been an upper limit on making the decisions on whether we return to in-person. But as from what I have seen, the decisions made by this district, they always chose the way that kept the schools closed and kept the children home. It is my understanding as a parent, we elected school board members to represent us as the parents. But as Todd had mentioned, when was the last time you sent a survey out to find out how we as parents felt how we wanted our schools to respond to these changes in requirements by the health department. I've seen the board claim that they care so much about equity, but while they chose to keep Oceanside students home, families who are able to send their children to private schools have been, had the advantage of being in school in person much longer. The data is no longer in your favor. The restrictive protocols are no longer in your favor and money is definitely in your favor. All of these excuses and hurdles that we've been looking at for the last year have been either greatly reduced or completely removed. Full-time in-person instruction, including lunches for all grades at all levels, anything less than that is unsatisfactory to me. And I will not be grateful that you will be returning to us our rights to education that should never have been taken from us in the first place. Actions speak louder than words. I'm done with the words from you guys. Take action tonight so that we as parents will remember this action when we put our votes in the ballot box. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And can you? Allison, Allison you? You're up, Allison. I'm trying to get my video here going. Hey, we saw you, there you are. All right, good evening board and Dr. Vitale. We are now one full year with minimal to no in-person instruction. Our parents are exhausted, juggling work, 
home tasks at hand and having to be a school teacher to their children. We, the parents here at the Parent Association of Oceanside are fed up with the school district's lip service. Sadly, the district and board have seemed to have ignored our children from, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Seem to have ignored our children from the most vulnerable special needs and all students in the district have suffered enough struggling with anxiety, depression, and suicide, which have all skyrocketed throughout this entire school year. And if that weren't enough, we now see on national news that there was a teacher from a neighboring district bullying students in virtual learning. I trust that this is not happening in Oceanside, but let's get our kids back in school. It's not an issue, it, so that it does not become an issue. The science is clear, students, teachers, and faculty can come back safely. <clears throat> and if we still continue to have parents and students afraid to come back to in-person instruction, then perhaps the board should instruct the district to educate their parents on the safety of schools and use science to show them that it's safe to come back. I am a parent of two young children and I'm saddened and upset that their entire school year <clears throat> has been robbed by a district that doesn't seem to have the, their students' best interest. <clears throat> and so now I will leave you at this and direct it to Dr. Vitale. We'd like to see you make right by your promise to the judge and move quickly and forward in reopening our schools to the greatest extent possible. It would be unfortunate if we were called back in front of the judge to explain why we didn't do what we said we would at our last hearing. Do what is right. Do what is right for our students. They are our future. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine Kerfer. All right, Elaine. Hi, you're up. Hi. Hi. My name is Elaine Keswick. My daughter, Coral, attends a special education preschool class in the district. I'm very disappointed to see that the board did not include said preschool in the new proposed schedules. I know this is a tiny um, population of students, but each student, including my daughter, is no less valuable. For this whole school year, I have been asking the district to consider the special needs of my daughter. Yet the district continues to ignore my daughter's right to a free appropriate public education by fully implementing her IEP. Special needs does not mean more important needs, but simply that her needs are very unique because of her disabilities. Her needs require her to have an IEP, an individualized education plan. It contains specific accommodations and models modifications, and even a unique class setting with a one-to-one -one aid in order to address these needs. They are needs that are a result of a rare chromosomal duplication called DUP15Q. She is the one in 10,000 to 15,000, my rare bear. Her needs make it so that distance learning is not appropriate. The virtual learning classroom was overwhelming, confusing, and nearly impossible for her to attend to beyond a few seconds here and there. It was the equivalent to her not receiving any education for so many months. I will say again that this has nothing to do with her teacher. It is just the reality of Coral's needs trying to be met by an inappropriate form of teaching and learning. I share this because my daughter lost hundreds of hours of instruction this year, and it didn't have to be this way. These are hours that all of the surrounding districts were able to give to their SPED preschool students for months now. Just as a comparison, if Coral attended a class in Solana Beach, she would have received conservatively 400 in-person SAI hours this school year. Instead, she has received roughly 50 hours of in-person learning time just because she lives in a different zip code. How is this equitable? This clearly has nothing to do with COVID. 
The educational code says that districts must offer in-person learning to the greatest extent possible. This means that if it can be done, it must be done. We know it can be done because every surrounding district has done it for their youngest and most impacted preschool students. So why does OUSD think it's okay to ignore educational code and my daughter's right to her education, especially since the district has been given millions of dollars to get kids back in class? I call coral my coral fish because she loves the water. If the world was a water park, she would not be considered disabled in so many ways. But instead, she is growing up in a world that judges her on her ability to climb a tree, expects her to climb a tree, and often values her life on how she climbs that tree. But she is my fish. Board members, I ask you to hold the district accountable to presenting plans for all students in the district, especially the ones like my daughter, who need to be in school to be learning, especially at this critical time of development. Thank you. Thank you. Our next three speakers will be Elizabeth Leha, Lynn Gonzalez, and Charles Finn. Elizabeth will be first. Good evening. Thank you for letting, good evening. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. I am speaking because I believe the district does not have the children of Oceanside's best interest at heart. Other districts all over the state have been able to open safely. 53% of parents in June notified the school that they wanted full-time instruction. This is the last data that the school district has collected. The data is no longer accurate. We need a new survey, but we are past that time. The district failed to do what they needed to do earlier this school year. Students in Oceanside are experiencing the painful loss of peer connections, connections with their teachers, school staff. They're suffering a serious loss of learning and will have lifelong consequences of this learning loss. We may not ever know the full extent, but we do know that our board has a job to protect the education of Oceanside's youth. I'm a parent of three children, an eighth grader who does not remember the names of his teachers this year, a 10th grader who is a three sport athlete, a straight A student who has no connection with her peers this year, none. I'm also a parent of a senior, a 4.4 GPA student who cannot even stand to talk about El Camino High. She will leave the room if the world words El Camino High School are even mentioned. She feels completely betrayed. My children are fortunate enough that I'm home to support their needs. And I know many others are not in the same bo boat as me. I'm asking the board to vote to open middle and high school students full time. The children of Oceanside deserve it and their mental health demands it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, Lynn Gonzalez. Hi, thank Hello. you. Hi, thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Dr. Begin, school board members, Dr. Vitali. My name is Lynn Gonzalez and I've been teaching in Oceanside for 29 years. Throughout the entirety of this school year, a very vocal minority of people, not just in Oceanside, but around the country, have offered up a perplexing idea that school districts are belligerently ignoring their desires to have their children in school. The truth is that school districts have been working tirelessly to provide a quality education while keeping the community safe during a pandemic. These are not normal circumstances by any, any, to say the least. Oceanside's elementary schools have already gone through four schedule changes this year, all in response to changes in our community's vulnerability to COVID-19. Needless to say, this is quite disruptive for our families. Now the district's administration is proposing yet another schedule change. This time it is not due to changes with the pandemic, but due to a failed lawsuit. The proposed schedule has not been vetted with teachers or parents 
and is planned to disrupt our families with just 32 days left in the school year. Perhaps most upsetting of all is that the proposal calls for all children to be in the classroom at the same time. It goes directly against CDC and California Public Health Department's strong recommendation that children maintain a minimum of three feet social distance from one another. The plan still contends that teachers will stay six feet away from children, even while having double the amount of students in their classrooms. Let's be clear, the idea that you can have a full classroom of students seated at double desks. All while maintaining three feet of social distancing, it's not even plausible. I urge you to slow this down. Parents and teachers need to have input. Decisions of this magnitude need to be collaborative with all stakeholders' positions considered. While vaccinations are offering us a bright tomorrow, we are not there yet. Do not spike the football at the 10 yard line. Let us remain with the current schedule and finish out this school year. Let us work on summer opportunities and a fresh start in August. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. Is that it? Yeah. Oh. Hi, Charles. Hey. Good evening. Uh, I'm just waiting for somebody to hit the full screen button because that'll block out my words that I've written down and I want to be able to see them. All right. Your okay, timer well. is starting. All right. Good evening, everyone. The district is proposing to return. See, now they did it and I can't see my writing. Sorry. The district's proposing to return all students to the classroom at once. I have 33 students. The minimal three foot social distancing just isn't possible in my classroom. The principal has been working with me, coming in and measuring, trying to come up with some sort of plan to accommodate 33 students three feet apart with me, the teacher, six feet away. No matter what the furniture configuration, it is not physically possible. So we're looking now at moving some students out of my class for the remainder of the year. That's literally squeezing kids shoulder to shoulder, inches apart. Why? Not because of health updates or new scientific understandings. It's just politics. This is responding to a lawsuit from a few angry but very vocal parents. But when do we get to hear the voices of the rest of my students' parents? They haven't been consulted about this soon to be fifth schedule change of the year. With all the various program changes, I am the third or fourth teacher many of my students have had this year. Now, if our only option is to move kids out of my classroom, some of them are gonna have to be moved and get another teacher for the last few weeks of school. And we need to be honest with the community. These proposed changes won't have a significant impact on the minutes of instruction. They will not increase social emotional support programs and services. These program changes weren't designed to help students. They're designed for the adults. They will make life easier for some of the parents and administrators while placing a burden on classrooms. My fifth graders understand why we do social distancing and they can see through this ridiculous notion that you'll have social distancing outdoors at recess and then pack people into an indoor classroom with no social distancing. I want to teach my students. I want to be with my students. I want them to be successful, but I want them to be safe above all. So I'm urging you to slow down this push for putting everybody in the room at the same time. We could accomplish as much with much greater safety just by using our existing schedule and adding students back on campus on Wednesdays. They'd still be in their AB cohorts, not crowded, still socially distanced, but more time and every day at school. Please pause and talk to the parents of all the students and all the stakeholders and find out what we need before you continue. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more speakers, Anne? No, we do not. Sean Hesse is not in the room. Oh, okay. 
So we're gonna shift into, let's see if we have any questions for staff. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, we're moving on to item nine personnel. 9A, um, we have a public hearing for proposed reopeners for the 2021-2022 school year. I'm opening the hearing at 10.36 p.m. Do we have any public comments, Anne? Yes, Todd Madison. All right, hi, Todd. Hi. You're up, you know the rules, three minutes? I do, all right, thank you very much. Um, there you go. Thanks. So tonight, I thought I would ask some questions of the board and district relating to the reopening negotiations. So first of all, is the board aware of the fact that the second interim budget showed a deficit of $9 million this year, rising to $19.9 million ahead? Is the board aware of the fact that this deficit spending has generally been the rule since 2017, when the district first dropped into qualified budget status? Is the board aware of the fact that this means there's, there's no way to increase costs without creating a need to cut from our kids? Is the board also aware of the fact that in 2019, full-time certificated employees had a median total pay of $91,000 with median total compensation of $120,000? Is the board aware of the fact that the Census Bureau and the Department of Ed numbers show our certificated employees make almost $31,000 a year more in total compensation than comparably educated county residents? Is the board, does the board understand what a Me Too raise is and how questionable the ethics around that are? Do they know that any increase negotiated will be applied to administrative staff, a group with a median total compensation of $158,000 a year? Is the board aware of the fact that OUSD has no turnover problems anywhere and that the district has no idea why any employees leave because they don't ask? Is the board aware of the fact that the district has never done a salary survey of wages in our area, so they have no idea how pay rates compare? Lastly, is the board aware of all the great things that could be funded for our kids with money that instead gets used for extra raises for employees over and over again? We see in the reopeners the intent is to provide fair and equitable compensation competitive in the market. From the actual data, we can already do that. We're done. That should make the negotiations quick. The idea that our staff is underpaid and ready to leave at the drop of a hat is simply not true. Both are just mis not just misunderstandings, but outright falsehoods, because the people who say this actually do know the data, but choose to ignore it because it serves their interests. I would suggest the board take its financial oversight responsibilities seriously and pay attention to the data when negotiating new agreements. Let me be clear. I think our staff is great. I think they're second to none. I think they should be paired fairly. I'm fine with existing pay rates and raise schedules. What I'm not fine with is cutting from our kids to support pay and increase rates substantially higher than comparable in our area. A few years ago, I was asked by asked, I was asked where parents were in these negotiations. I asked where parents were in these negotiations. We're paying the bills. We're the ones the kids are hurt by cuts. I was told by a board member that he was my representative in this. It's true, however, I have to note that during the last election, there were zero contributions disclosed to his campaign by parents, contrasting with six thousand spent on his behalf by the union. I'd suggest all our boards start actually representing parents in these negotiations, not their campaign contributors. Let's do something different this time. Let's put our kids' interests first, not our district's interests. Thanks. And do we have any more public comment? Not on this item. I'm sorry, it's getting late. Todd, thanks for hanging in with us. Todd, would you like to get started? Oh, this, this is easy. I just second Eric. That, that's all I was going to point out is that it just seems like you're limiting your ability to agree or disagree um, with the board in ways to promote the board's ability to govern the district. It just seems like you wouldn't want to um, to do that to yourself. But um, so that's the extent of my public comment. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for hanging in there. Looking? No, we, we do not, we Stacey. We do not. Okay, so we're moving right on to item 14, board staff discussion, because we haven't had enough of that tonight. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts or discussion items? Um, I, just think that I would just on a point of personal privilege, should have said it earlier to uh, Mr. Madison, um, that I did not receive any campaign contributions from anybody because I did not have a campaign committee when I ran. Uh, contrary to what uh, Todd had a campaign contribute committee and raise money from whomever across the community, which is his right to do. But I did not raise any money for my campaign for school board race. Other people may have raised money on my behalf, but I had no control or, or any control of that whatsoever. So please clarify any statements you make in the future, Todd, about that fact. 
Thank you.